Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here, and I'm doing a movie review this week. It's a very underrated buddy cop type comedy called Short Time. It's a film about a detective from Seattle, Washington, who is ready to be retired, already being concerned about his future plans, including with his relationship with his wife and his young son, until all of a sudden, after taking his physical at the hospital, which results into a crazy mix-up, he soon have found out that he only has two weeks to live, and that alone would earn even more money instead of a small amount by actually signing up for double duty. So that means he'll actually get killed in the line of duty. Yeah. But of course, getting killed isn't as easy as it looks, just like the tagline in the poster. Well, I just finished watching the film, which I gotta admit, it was... It's kind of crazy and, <laughs> and and rather strange, you know, having to deal with all this crazy antics and getting killed. Well, this movie, of course, um, had never received an official DVD release in the U.S. You know, which sad to say, we only got stuck with the 1990 VHS release from Live Entertainment. Yeah, so they haven't. Uh, you know, re-release it all this time. You know, I'm hoping that this movie will get a widescreen release. Or, who knows. Well, apparently sometime in the future, maybe, uh, who knows, maybe Shout Factory or, or possibly MGM will probably get a chance. Or, hey, maybe Kino or all the films might take a chance on releasing this film on Blu-ray and DVD because, unfortunately, the copy that I just found was actually taken directly from an NTSC Korean DVD release, which is apparently almost a direct copy from the UK release uh, from Cotton Media in the UK, yeah, which had a DVD release that's that's in PAL format, and I could tell because this one actually had that the rank organization logo, yeah, the one where they show the guy. Yeah, hanging the gong, yeah, that famous uh, J. Arthur Rank logo, which is a, a production company in the UK that started uh, releasing mostly other films, um, yeah, which is the, it's their international distribution for several films that they release in their libraries. Which I know this film was released from 20th Century Fox in 1990. Which Gladden Entertainment co-produced the film. You know the same company that released Mannequin, you know the Manhattan Project, and even um, Weekend at Bernie's. Unfortunately, the film that I have is is in full frame, not in widescreen, not the greatest print that I ever expected, because it is indeed a UK print of it. So that means it's in PAL format and and actually speeds up its running time. So, well. That was the only way I can actually watch the film, and it's kind of a shame because I, I kind of wish this film wasn't widescreen because the film would have looked so much better. I guess it's better than nothing though, because otherwise, I would wind up uh, finding a, a VHS copy of this film somewhere at the thrift store or possibly at Goodwill if they have a copy, because it's so hard to find uh, as of now. Yeah, but let's see what happens. So anyway, the film stars Dabney Coleman. With Terry Gar, you know, both of which had appeared in the film Tootsie. So this is their second film together, even though they, you know, they didn't have uh, enough screen time. So <laughs> that's that's a shame. But I guess they had to have it this way, so it wouldn't matter. Matt Fewer, who's been best known as his role in Max Headroom, and he later went on to do two short-lived shows, Doctor Doctor, and Shaky Ground. And went on to do a lot of films, including uh, the movie Dawn of the Dead remake, and of course um, Watchmen. In fact, most recently he was in the movie called Night of the Museum: Secret of the Tomb. Yeah, it's a very short role that he had, so it was nice to see him. You know, already looking a little older now. Yeah, but I always remember him. Yeah, Barry Coben, Joe Pantiano. You know, who's had a lot of work in, in his career, including his role in 
in Midnight Run, as well as uh, The Fugitive. He wants up in the TV series Sopranos. Yeah, and of course he went on to do the film Daredevil, which I didn't care for. Alexander Berkeley, you know, went on to do other films too, including um, Candyman, Evolution, Air Force One, Kyle J. Eric Eberson, Rob Roy, Tony Patagis, Kim Kontrahoff, Paul Jarrett, Kevin McNulty, Paul Batten, Sam Mulkin, and Russ Twitter. And it's directed by Greg Champion, who's been best known for directing films such as License to Drive with the two Corys, Corey Hain and Corey Feldman, and Bushwhack with Daniel Stern. The movie begins when a soon-to-be-retired detective from Seattle, Washington named Bert Simpson, who's played by Dabney Coleman, who's just been celebrating for his early retirement at the police force along with his partner, Ernie Dills, who's played by Matt Feuer, who's already been concerned about planning for the future that he just couldn't help you know, dealing with, which actually involves his relationship with his wife, Carolyn, who's played by Terry Garr, along with his young son, Dougie, who's played by Kyle Eric Erickson. But things starts to change when suddenly he decided to take his physical for life insurance at the hospital, which all of a sudden causes a crazy mix-up by a bus driver trying to hide his recent use of marijuana in the system, that he soon had to find out from a call from the doctor at the hospital that that he only has two weeks to live. So that means that that he will only receive a small amount of money if he dies of natural causes for his family. But his plan was that if he gets killed in the line of duty, he would see thousands enough to earn its share so that way, you know, sooner or later, his young son, Dougie, will wind up um, becoming a future Harvard University student. So his first attempt was to center around a domestic disturbance call, which actually turned out to be an elderly couple, you know, one of them being deaf and all. That kind of failed. But his second attempt was one of the biggest one of all, was when he decided to get involved in a wild car chase between Carl Stark, who was a drug smuggling gun dealer who wants up uh, with his two henchmen, Michael and Jonas Lutz, <laughs> which apparently he drove all the way through the freeway chasing them around while Jonas winds up shooting with, with a machine gun in front of all the cops chasing them around, including Bert, and which, <laughs> which Bert winds up, you know, getting his entire vehicle, his red car vehicle, <laughs> being shot at, with a lot of broken glass around, a lot of gunshots everywhere, all getting smashed, beat up, you know, flipped over, crashed. And it's all, <laughs> all messed up, and, and drove all the way straight to the street, you know, trying to go, trying to go after them, you know, being crashed into, you know, shades of glass, and all the way around, you know, through the entire streets. Almost seemed like a reference to the French Connection when they went straight to that, uh, that, uh, <clears throat> when they went straight to the bridge. And then suddenly, when he stopped right in the corner of the bridge, you know, ready for these two to actually crash into him, yeah, it was that actually did happen? These two actually crashed right straight into his car, and <laughs> and they suddenly flipped over to the side, and <laughs> yeah, already, you know, already Bert's car has already been totaled completely, and he he got out of the car and he says. Can't you idiots do anything right? <laughs> Which apparently he didn't get killed. He almost did. <laughs> but suddenly it earned him a medal for his bravery. Which sends these two guys in the hospital. <laughs> of course, early in the film, Carl Stark had actually started uh, going after these shipments filled with powerful weapons. That they were about to sell. Yeah, along with these two. He was also working for uh, Joe Pantelano's character. 
in the film as well. Yeah. It involves that, that scene where he actually shoots uh, <laughs> his wife's uh, cousin's car. Yeah, it blew his door off out of there. Yeah, it was hilarious. But then his third attempt involves a hostage situation involving a crazed man with a bomb at, the, at a local uh, food mart. And he finally actually convinced the bomber to give himself off, which <laughs> I know causes a big explosion at the market, which receives another medal for his action. So between these events, he spends more time what he believes it might be his final days, that he decided to spend more time with his son, you know, reconciles with his wife, and actually gives uh, his partner, you know, during uh, when they went to a to a, a local restaurant, you know, giving him uh, lobster and everything. He generally respects him so much that he actually gives Ernie his red sports car that's a Mustang. So then, beginning to find out what's going on, Ernie had found out that he must have had a big suspicion involving his strange behavior that he does his investigation of his own and soon had found out what has happened, which seems to me that this was just part of a, uh, a crazy mix-up. But by the time he finally found out, Simpson has gotten involved in a running shootout with the heavily armed Stark, you know, and then the chase winds up ending in, with both of them balanced on the window washer's scatfall on the height of a skyscraper, in which then, you know, Ernie ha actually revealed to him that, that he's not going to die, which apparently would be too late because, <laughs> which all of a sudden, you know, Stark winds up falling to his death, oh, and then after that, you know, he soon falls after him, which apparently <laughs> it cuts right to the to the next scene, which they want about a funeral, only to find out that the guy to turn out to be the bus driver who actually died of his condition, you know, during the that scene with the when when he was driving on the bus and, and he was receiving a lot of blindness going around, and he actually crashed into the bus stop. And while Simpson did fall from the scaffold, you know, he had received a broken leg, you know, already being entangled with some ropes, you know, already dangling upside down, as you saw in the poster, and of course, uh, <laughs> the photograph, as you saw. And so things were going so well for him, so once he found out that there's another um, chase going around, he decided to uh, he'll just go out uh, with his partner and his family to do whatever they want. Yeah, in, in their lives and then the movie ends for a crazy film like this I gotta admit it it's it's pretty well made I mean it's also very funny at times when they knew you know <laughs> having to deal with you know Bert's strange behavior involving the situation the fact that he was trying to keep a secret from his wife and his son so he thought maybe you know that way they won't even know if if he's actually dying or not and so the fact that he's trying to take good care of everything that's going on. Yeah. <laughs> Which all of this had involves a lot of crazy situations involving, you know, those three bad guys in the movie. And then, of course, that long walk car chase scene that we saw, it almost seemed like it's borrowed right out of the movie uh, The French Connection and Bullet. But I know several films had done that same car chase scene that's just like what you saw in the movie. But, you know, but even for a comedy, I think it did work. And the fact that uh, getting involved at the end that involves um, that crazy shootout on top of the building, you know, through the skyscraper is probably the most insane scenes I've ever watched. And usually I don't, it's kind of hard to watch scenes like this because, you know, you feel like you have a, a small amount of vertical because you feel like you're going to fall in. But that was one of the craziest scenes I ever saw in the movie, especially when, <laughs> you know, they actually had a helicopter pilot actually took a picture of that situation <laughs> involving the two already hanging on the scarf wall. But I also like the scene where, you know, already with the two guys, uh, Michael and Jonas, you know, already, <laughs> already in the hospital, you know, already being cast with, with a broken leg and, and a broken neck and everything. <laughs> Yeah, 
Bert wants up uh, trying to find out where Clark Stark is, and he was <laughs> he was pulling the strings, and they're all just <laughs> already their legs are being moved up in front, and <laughs> and his body's been moving up <laughs> like that. And after he was trying to give him the number to find out who where he is, it, I mean that was a very funny scene. And uh, I also like the scenes where you know <laughs> he he was already you know dealing with that one guy who's was telling them that you can't do all this stuff and the fact that they failed at what they're doing that caused, caused them to get laughed at yeah Bert finally get his revenge on that one guy and he made fun of them and <laughs> by actually opening the locker and it went into his face <laughs> yeah he got exactly what he deserved for being a jerk and then <laughs> And then, of course, uh, Ernie actually says, I love you, Bert Simpson. <laughs> and it, it was cool. You know, Daddy Coleman did a good job playing Bert Simpson because this was definitely, you know, one of his craziest roles I ever saw. Uh, Matt Fuhrer did a good job playing Ernie Dills, you know, as his partner, you know, working for 10 years. Yeah, and everybody was great in the film. Um, you know, Terry Garr, and, which is sad to say, only got a short role, but that's okay. I mean, she... She, she had enough screen time, uh, along with his son, uh, who's played by Carl Eric Erickson. So, yeah, they had a lot of good scenes that they went in. Um, had a good score by Ara Noonborn, and and it even has a song called Well With It by Steve Winward. Yeah, that, that was a good song. So, yeah, it's, it's a very funny movie. Uh, it's a very and truly underrated too. Um, not many people talk about it as much, and and quite honestly, uh, the film was panned by critics. Yeah, I don't know though. I I did enjoy the film. I I didn't think it wasn't as bad as some people think, but I think it's you know, it's those one of those films where you know something's gonna go wrong after the fact. So, <laughs> but the fact is, it was fun. That's all I could say. But anyway, I give Short Time three stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.